Now, let's start this at the beginning. Your ear should have been burning for the last week. Actually, 10 days, give or take. Why? What things have you been saying about me, Mother Vi? <laughs> See, what had happened was, uh, drove to Maryland for Women of Drummer. Uh, right. Four days in front Which I heard was fantastic. Four days. I saw you and Judy Tolley. <laughs> naked, getting into trouble, uh, spending a lot of time enjoying the next generation, getting some much needed energy. Uh huh. Well, nice. that led to, you know, because I'm not running through the woods, this is why old people have carts. Uh, <laughs> and sitting and talking with a lot of the next generation. Okay. Uh, talk revolved, a lot of it revolved around the library and the new um, visiting scholars program, of which Tony's mm -hmm. been my first and my senior scholar. Tony's been at the library nice. three times in the last eh, 13, 14 months for about a month each time. Wow. Uh, well, that's kind of what it's set up for. And we're still right. working out a lot of the details for which Tony has been a godsend, um, you know, in terms of, of things like what scholars might like to access and so on. Well, in talking to a whole lot of women about can they come and be a visiting scholar in the library, sure. The conversation turned to other women who had sought higher degrees in either women's politics or sex, the concept of sexology, mm -hmm. uh, which immediately led to you and Annie Sprinkle. Uh, but Annie hasn't produced bodies of work other than her dissertation. So then topic then rolls right along to you in terms of scholarly access um how you put together i guess the background information the surveys the questionnaires whatever it takes to begin to do both dissertations and other scholarly works like different loving what i didn't realize was that five of the women who have signed on to come visit for anywhere from two to four weeks next year are all either single or double PhDs. And they're all fascinated wow. in you. <laughs> um, Gail came up, Ruben, but Gail's um, research is more cultural anthropology than direct sexology. Right. And, um, so in listening to all of this and being the provider of the location, but most assuredly not the scholar here, uh, listening to people talking about different loving mostly um, and other works and other articles and one quoted the pretenders, which just cracked me up. Uh, because that was read by a lot more people than you realize. I a lot of things well. came up that I could just listen to. One would be, what would make a woman go into a field that evidently has been so dominant, either shut down by men or so dominated by men? So now that you've got some of the background, I can kind of toss out some of the things that were discussed, that was one. Whether or not one of the new directions is sexology and politics, not a clue. Yes. Uh, whether more, 
attention maybe needs to be paid to the founding women of uh, sexology. And I wasn't sure where they were going with that because I think more suffragette rather than going back beyond the Kansas anarchist movement, you know, with women like uh, who were railing against this, the, uh, the system mm -hmm. like and Harmon and others. And mm -hmm. all of this comes down to you're a pioneer here. What, what would you say to women who want to do more research, who want to produce more works, um, advice? Talk to me, because I'm not even but sure where I'm going with this, except for the fact that, man, you were the co topic of a whole lot of conversations. Okay. You know, for me, really, my life started over when I founded that s &M group on CompuServe, and then it really started over when I wrote Different Loving. So, but let me just quickly answer the how a woman gets into a male-dominated field and persists and manages to thrive in it. Um, I would say there are a few different answers. First, if you want to get anywhere in life, you have to be ready to face men and compete with them. And it doesn't matter what field you're in. I mean, the same could be said of the scene. You know, up until X number of years ago, and you were a pioneer, you really didn't hear a lot of women's voices, not on the platforms, not on the panels. It was, you know, there'd be one woman and five men. And I still go to conferences where it's one woman and everybody else is a guy to talk about something big, you know? So, and our world is so much better than the vanilla world in that respect. So, you know, I was a late bloomer career-wise. Um, I didn't write Different Loving until I was like 33 or maybe even 34 um, because I'd done a lot of other things. And one of the things I'd done was working on Wall Street. And that was where I really had my fight over how does a woman make it in a man's world? But... Um, and I was a feminist, so patriarchy always pissed me off. And I became kind of defiant and I was defiant wherever I went. I wouldn't, you know, people would try to uh, make me act more feminine in the workplace. And I just, I didn't yell about it or anything. I just wouldn't do it. Yeah. I had had the conversation with one of my bosses about where he called me in to tell me that that you attract more flies with honey because everybody felt I was too bossy that's when I remember that, you know, this was pre s &M when I was on Wall Street I hadn't really fathomed that I was a femdom I was just like a bossy bitch from Brooklyn at the time <laughs> you know but men had never intimidated me the way they do many women. Mm -hmm. I hope not our BDSM sisters so much, but that's an evolution that I think a lot of us go through. Uh, even the ones who I see it in my sub, Jennifer, you know, that she started off with attaching a certain authority to men and not anymore. <laughs> you know, 20 years later, but maybe of living with me, you know, she's like, uh, the, the veil has been lifted over the illusions, you know, which is okay. I mean, we both love men, but different expectations of what they're supposed to be like. Let's put it that way. And I think even today that if I had been a man, my work would be better known and I would not have been censored 
as much. Because I may seem famous and I kind of am in that a lot of people know me around the world and that's really cool. And a lot of people have read my book and that's cool. I have international clients in the wildest places. I don't know how they heard about me, but I guess they read about me on the internet or something, you know? So all of that is really awesome and I'm very grateful. But I also know that if I was a man and I had broke this kind of critical ground, that probably I would have had more acknowledgement <laughs> culturally. So there is always, uh, there persists this thing about women being treated differently in society than men are. Men are much more likely to be praised for lesser efforts than women who work their asses off. <laughs> You know, it's just the, and if you're not ready to constantly fight that fight, this is not a field for you. And I don't know what would be a field for you that includes a lot of public achievement because men have a lock on most of it, whether it's medicine or science, politics or anything else. It's always going to be harder for a woman to raise money than a man. So I didn't, you know, once I found sex was a field <laughs> that I could study, um, I just wanted to know everything about sex. And not just BDSM sex. That's what, B, what writing about BDSM sex did for me was first of all, of course, it meant writing something I knew and understood and loved and which I felt was insanely twisted by culture, completely misrepresented, portrayed as pathological, you know, whereas I knew it was safe, sane, consensual, that it was as old as time, I already knew that because I had read a lot of books and I found it in every book, no matter where I traveled, that there would be references to the kind of shit we do and to, you know, right? So, but what Different Loving did for me was made me realize that the biggest struggle in the world is that nobody knows what normal is. And the way that normal is defined is so fucking narrow and so heteronormative binary. But beyond that, it's like even to a point where certainly even back in 1990, nobody, you know, blowjobs were considered kinky. Anal sex was off the menu. I got censored in Canada because I wrote a piece for Cosmo about anal sex. <laughs> well, Canada's hung up well. I got censored in Canada. Yeah. But this was like, you know, 1994. It's not, I don't know if it's like that anymore. Yeah, you too? Yeah. You know, so, and this started driving me not to just think that everybody is wrong about BDSM, but that everybody's wrong about sex in general. You know, that everybody's basing their ideas about sex on things people said before we had scientific data. And starting with Kinsey, we started accumulating the scientific data. And with actual scientific data, and mean, meaning reproducible results, right? What science? Science means that you can prove something because it happens again and again and you can show that it happens again and again, that you can reproduce the same results. So you take a group of people, you put them in a room at an orgy, and you're going to see that there's a lot of bisexuality. That's what Kinsey would do. Yeah. You know, or that there's a lot of oral sex, even though everybody th is supposed to think that's bad or wrong or sinful. 
you know? So he actually, because he was a, a scientist who studied wasps. <laughs> he took his wasp mating observation skills and applied them to human beings. Seriously? Yeah. He took a, an object or tried to at the beginning until he started playing with them because it made him horny, but certainly at the beginning. <laughs> He took an objective opinion and just watched what they did and took notes without imposing ideology on it. Like, is it right or wrong? He looked at it like he looked like any zoologist looks at an animal sex life. They're not like, ooh, that nasty thing. Look what that, <laughs> that duck just raped a duck. You know, that they don't see it that way they see it as wow that is an aggressive sexually aggressive species make a note <laughs> we don't say every duck has s and m sex or every duck has rape sex <laughs> you know it's only when it comes to humans that we're really judgmental so that was really to me the great gift that kinsey gave us was he put human sexuality under a scientific lens so that's the kind of work that I saw myself doing because I was a poet and I felt like as a poet, I needed to share my personal truths. But now that I was a sexologist, I could share these really universal facts that there is no such thing as normal, that if there is such a thing as normal, then it's diversity, diversity is normal diversity of gender, diversity of sexual orientation, diversity of desire, that, and that kink just falls under that huge umbrella of diversity. And boy, that's a topic that I just can't stop writing about. Thank you. You know, I mean, and that's really kind of what keeps me going, I think, is that most adults still need to be sexually re-educated. You know, they learn things like never touch yourself. You know, or God's, you know, your ancestors are watching from heaven while you're having sex. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, that too many orgasms is a bad thing. Exhaustion can be a problem, yes. Stay hydrated. <laughs> you know, but I mean, all of the things, all of the myths we were raised on, all of the weird beliefs, all of the... You know, it's sort of like I've never been really a huge fan of like normalizing slut, you know, because I don't want to normalize, you know, it's kind of like normalizing f faggot to me, you know, it's kind of, mm. it's their old crappy word. And by they, I mean, what? we know who they are. <laughs> And is it a word worth saving or popularizing? I don't know, because its fundamental assumption is that, you're being singled out for having a lot of sex. Interesting. Hmm. Why? Does it matter? Does it matter if one person has 20 orgasms a week and one has three? No. Does it matter if someone has zero orgasms a week? Hell yes. Those people are not working with their health. True. And that can have long-term negative effects on your overall health. And... Um, so it's kind of been a twin journey, you know, like intellectually, I'm really curious about anything and everything and all of the medical research related to sex. And experientially, 
I've gone through this amazing BDSM evolution like all my leather kin have. You know, that we've come to us elders who are happy and still involved in the scene. I feel have gotten so much from the scene in terms of um, emotional strength, personal empowerment, um, more of a, especially for women, a voice to demand equality. You know, and I look inside our world, I was describing it in fact to a totally vanilla friend of mine right after my husband died. She's like, oh, you must've been so alone and lonely. And I was like, are you kidding me? 500 people express condolences to me through social media. And, you know, so many of my close leather friends, including you, either sent me care packages or tried to send me care packages or reached out to me and said, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Should I send you a box of food? You know, I mean, nothing replaces, you know, nothing is as good as that. And it's times like that that remind me how lucky I am that I chose to do this work for people who can appreciate this work. Yeah. And, and because my mind is racing, like I said, Gloria, I was the fascinated outsider listening to so much of this. Um, if you were going to direct five women from the next generation or from a new and emerging generation of sexologists to pick five topics to research for dissertations or other scholarly works, what would they be? Now they should be their own, the thing that really captures their own interest. Do so for example, if, if one of those women is a sex worker, maybe she would, in fact, I have a friend who had been a sex worker and she did her dissertation on the history of femdoms. Can I get it? Going back to the 19th century. What? Can I get a copy? Uh, I'll tell you after this because she's very private these days. The, so I'll tell you who it is and how to contact her. The, the, I would, I have no problem with you contacting her. Quick squirrel. The reason for the question is. Um, I have access through a couple of services that I pay for to a lot of mm -hmm. dissertations and a few articles that come out. And I grab them for the library's Dropbox because I make dissertations, the library's collecting them. I don't even need to know. I will definitely, I will definitely contact her and well, her name will be on it, so you will know. Uh, if she wants to change it or take out the title page or change it on the title page, it's being able to have those bodies of work to make them available to scholars. Yeah, and, and she, her, her scholarship was amazing because she went to Germany and studied at the uh, Hirschfeld collection. And he was one of the first people to write about BDSM would, yeah, like in the 20s, oh. right. Yeah, so she has really good research. I will uh, I will talk to her and see if you know, there's a way to get it. Not trying to invade her privacy. I've got nothing but mad respect for that. Try oh, no, it's, it's not my respect. I don't have privacy, but uh, she's private for a, a range of reasons. So, okay. Trying to just get her work to add to a body that our people can access easily. Like I said, I pay a couple of hundred dollars a year to be able to scroll through, um, you know, certain forums that are only meant for universities so that their scholars- Oh yeah, I want to has her PhD on file. 
I'll go look and see if it's somewhere on the internet too. Uh, okay, you know, if so it's the, basically, wonderful. yeah, yeah. I think the key for any person and particularly woman looking, but anyone really looking to pick what their dissertation is, I think in the best of all cases, they will pick something that they are already passionate about, want to understand as comprehensively, so comprehensively, they are going to be the expert in that field. That is their goal, to be the top expert in their field. Whether they make it or not is not as important as wanting it. Got it. Because making it is a combination of luck and circumstances and networking and all kinds of shit. But doing the work, number three, should be satisfaction. The saddest thing is when somebody picks a PhD topic they think is going to help their career or get them hired somewhere. And then they either never go back to it, you know, or they never work in that field. You know, so for me, even though it took me a while to write another book, um, at that moment when I started working on Different Loving, I was possessed by it. It was 24-7. And when I write a book, it's 24-7. In other words, I, I'm eating dinner and I'm playing with my friends. But I never, but the book is usually present. Understood. And I'm already planning the other chapters. Why? Because it's my baby. You know, because I'm obsessed with it or because, you know, not a day goes by that I don't read sexual news headlines. And I'm really curious because the, you know, I'm really lucky because we have so much scientific data now that didn't even exist 20 years ago. All right. So, hold, hold that thought. Right. And don't be afraid to, spe to specialize either. Like, what if your heart really belongs to um, disempowered young women and teaching them how to develop? you know, by giving them tools to be sex educators. We need educators who are going to educate the next generation of sex educators. You just said there is so much information. And yet we are, as a society, we are locked into a Judeo-Christian for the purpose of procreation only 2.2 kids mentality. With mm -hmm. all of the information that is out there, how do we break out of a 3,000, maybe four or 5,000 year old prison in terms of woman as, uh, what was the term, a quiverful for men? And that her only purpose is to have babies. How do we break the hell out of that? I think that women of color are going to lead the way forward because they already are in so many different fields. I think that after you struggled your whole life with racism, tackling inequity in sexuality is not as big a struggle for you. Interesting you know there's injustice in the world. You're ready for that. You're ready to be disappointed and to fight your way through it. You are gonna build a network of women who support you and valuable friendships that are gonna keep you propped up. You're going to have a focused community where you can find peace, whether it's your church, your Wiccan circle, your s and tribe, you probably have a community. 
And um, you're liberated. Even if you haven't yet come to live that liberated life, if you've done a lot of work. And I see these women doing a lot of work in the last few years, a lot of political awakening, a lot of consciousness raising, a lot of understanding how the world really works. And <clears throat> I'd love to see it uh, as vigorously pursued by all white people, but it's not. Is that a religious brainwashing or a male brainwashing question? I think it really always comes down to uh, You mean why white women are not more? Well, because they can get along. They can fit into, you know, the normative framework if they want. Even if they're pretending, they still have privilege in culture. In, in And I don't think the last two elections, Gloria, when I looked at what women were thinking and saying, I was horrified that some things I, I would rather, uh, what was it? I would rather have a sex offender than a woman. I can't remember which of the politicians, one of the senator or one of the people running for senatorial election was a convicted sex Well, senator. politicians are... Yeah. But I mean, it's the fact that women were backing this. Oh, yes. And but what, what is wrong with you? Well, what is wrong with Ann Coulter? I mean, I One of the most vicious and vile women that ever existed and is constantly given a platform. How does that happen? If Chris Jenner, I'm sorry, I just didn't. I heard it. that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, been there, done. It hurts to admit she's a woman. Okay, but if Kate Gen Jenner were black, what are the chances of her even getting two percent of the vote? True. So the reality of America, yes, is that we're still binary, heteronormative, systemic racism, tremendous amount of oppression of the poor, exploitation of the poor. Yes, this is our real world. <laughs> but this, it is better to be exploited than to step out and say, stop, mystifies me. And I guess in, in bringing it back to where we started, that's so much of what excited me listening to these young women talking. You know, that, that willingness to explore sexuality in general, explore women's sexuality and its power, and yes. to create something new from all of this. I, after Different Loving, I wanted to write a book precisely about how culture has dismantled female power systematically. Oh! A long book where I looked even at, like, even the, you know, it's like, when you look at the old Greek myths and when you look at a lot of different things, you realize women had incredible power. Yes. The power to start wars. Or stop them. Or stop them, you know? And when you look at how men wrote about it, the woman always seems like the idiot or the helpless maiden or the captive maiden 
You know, Helen of Troy. She wasn't just kidnapped. She wanted to go. She wanted to fuck the other guy. Yes. And two men had a huge pissing contest over that. Yeah. And thus Western more. civilization was changed. <laughs> you know? I mean, it was like a, you know, a fight in the street between Guido and Guido. <laughs> You fuck my woman. I fuck your country. <laughs> and the woman's just standing there going, hey, you know, you're not all that and a bag of chips. Yeah, she's like, listen, did I say I wanted to come home? <laughs> now I get kidnapped back? Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> Whereas yeah. I think Helen of Troy must have been one hot bitch, man. Yeah. Who knew exactly how to get what she wanted. Look at Cleopatra. Hell, hot chips. Look. look at some of the most. Yeah, and then they things. always make her so pathetic. You know, like Caesar broke her heart and she had to kill herself. Fuck. She didn't kill herself she over Caesar. What the fuck? Fucked. He was just one of many. He was a conquest. It wasn't just the other way around, as we are led to believe. So I wanted to reconstruct a lot of the old life. Nobody wanted that book. This was 1995. Nobody. Somebody, in fact, my editor said, no one will publish this. Things have changed. Things have changed. Have changed. I don't want to write that book anymore, but you know. <laughs> People don't even read books so much anymore, why, you know? You'd be surprised. Because, for except it. for your wonderful group who are dedicated, dedicated to education in a way that very that we seldom see in other places, including in college. <laughs> <laughs> you know, having been a college teacher, I can tell you that. It's always a handful of people who are serious and the rest are just getting their slip signed, you know? Then maybe, maybe the library as a phenomenon has been lucky in that I've watched, when we take it out, I watch a certain group of people make the library home for that event. Um, there can be times when we're in the library until two and three in the morning because we stay in the those, those are the people that should get the most love. And they do. And the library seems to bring that group out. Um, as I said last week, well, te technically it was weekend before last now, um, just sitting still. And letting those scholars find me because of what I represented. They weren't finding me to talk to Vi. They were finding me to talk to someone who is connected to this fantasy place where, you know, is it real and can I really come live there and study? Yes. Oh. Uh, and Gloria, the there are thing. They're more than you realize. Um I don't want to say they're looking for heroes. What I believe is they're looking for inspiration and direction in creating something yeah. that I can see the grain of sand on. I don't know where it's going to go um, or how long it will take to grow, but they're looking for inspirations. Right. And, you know, I was inspired sometimes positively, sometimes negatively, by all the books, not that there were a whole lot of them, but by the early books on BDSM, like Coming to Power and the Leatherman's Handbook and, um, oh my God, there were some more that were really pretty weird. I can't remember the title now, but Angel Von Stern, do you remember that book? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and 
they were a combination of practical advice, heartfelt analyses, and, you know, Coming to Power was a very powerful book for me, you know, and helped me reframe BDSM a whole lot. Um, Ginny Graham Scott had a book out about the s &M church in California, which I understand is still a, in business is the um, in San way Francisco. The I've heard Indian it in, way is what it was called. Yeah. Which? The church. Uh, the church. Yeah. Right. And I forget what Ginny Graham Scott book was called. But anyway, um, so those books, I think what happened is some of them gave me new ideas to latch on to. The essays from the lesbian collective, certainly uh, with Patrick Califia's introduction, these were all meaningful to me. But also what was meaningful were people who misrepresented us or wrote against us. At the time, and I know this is sad to say now, but at the time, Audre Lorde was really opposed to s &M. And boy, that upset me. So she kind of put out her own anthology that was like a, a slapback at the Patrick Califia anthology, you know, of voices of women, feminism talking about why s &M was bad for you and shit. So I was inspired on both ends. In other words, I felt like, no, I think I can prove that person wrong. That was some of the books that I read. And then there were some of the books where, wow, that's an idea I would love to think about and expand on. Okay. So I think the practice of reading a lot of stuff is really effective when you pick out the quotes that have real meaning to you and the concepts that have real meaning to you, mm -hmm. because that could be the birth of your life's work right there. Is there a question you want to answer? That's a really good place for a sexologist to start. Is there a question about gayness, being lesbian, being bi, being transgender, being uh, kinky or anything else, or even how orgasm works, which I wanted to know as a person who loves to have them and loves to give them. I wanted to know the biology of it. Like, really, how does this thing work? How do we get from I see somebody to I have to fuck them right now or I'll die? <laughs> You just gave a whole new definition to primal urge. <laughs> and then being a nerd, I have to go read a book on it or research it. Okay. And then if I research it and I realize I did the research, fuck yeah, I'm going to write about it. Look what I learned. Oh my God. <laughs> did you know? Listen to what that person said about this. Holy shit. You know, that was one of the really fun parts about Different Loving was we let the interviewees speak for themselves and talk about how much they like getting a dildo shoved in their ass and how ecstatic and high it made them feel. I'm like, there's the stuff. That's the stuff people need to know. They need to know about positive experiences and how you can find personal happiness with a better sex life or a better SM life, you know. You got me right in my crazy. <laughs> so. You know, before, I mean, I originally studied English, right? I started this whole thing as a poet. So, I mean, my adult life is a poet and 
And that's all I wanted to be when I was in my teens, really, a poet. So the natural thing was to go into English, to study English at a graduate level, and then one day be a poetry teacher, professor. That was my path. Low pay, low everything, you know, low feedback, but whatever, it was my heart. And um, going to graduate school gave me my research skills. Okay. Right? Just, but there was nothing, I didn't really love it, you know? I didn't love it. I loved writing, but teaching about writing and teaching English and all of that, I didn't love it. Like you had to teach grammar for God's sakes. I always hated grammar. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I wanted to be able to write and that was how I was supporting myself. But when I found sex, I loved it. I loved the fact that there was so much to correct. I hope young women are listening to that and gaining oh inspiration. God. But you know, suddenly it was like, no, people are not sick for wanting this. They may be more normal than you, in fact, because what are you doing with your sex life? Are you only having missionary position sex with your partner on Saturday nights? Wow, is that freaky. For the purpose of procreation only. Don't forget that part. Uh -huh. That is some freaky, unnatural human behavior. It's not what we were wired for. Uh, I want to take you slightly left here. Because okay. I want the opinion of a sexologist, not a writer. Uh, although in some cases they're mixed. Fifty Shades of Stoop, uh, Gray. There, there are a lot of different kinds of sexology. Like, you could be a forensic psychologist. Agreed. I mean, a forensic sexologist. So that's a person who actually goes to court and testifies in cases where people are either accusing someone of a crime or have been accused right. of a crime related to sex. And I find it a fascinating field because I'm a ghoul who watches all the true crime on TV all the time. <laughs> it's like, is there a new death show? Do I have to watch the same death show that I have seen three times already about that lady who got pushed off the, the mountain by her husband? You know, <laughs> it's my nasty little addiction. But, um, you know. Forensic sexuality is much broader than that. So, for example, True. let's say you know somebody who is committed of a sex crime that you don't think is a sex crime. Time to research. Time to look it up. Time to figure out what kind of a change you could make in that system. Or create the research needed for future cases. Correct. Now, in that or become a forensic expert and make a shit ton of money. Because <laughs> that's one of the few ways sexologists can make a lot of money. Fascinating. Because that pays a lot more than clients pay. Because, you know, you're going to charge like 300 bucks an hour or more. In that vein. Mm hmm and this one's going to run a little around, so I, I beg your forgiveness. Sure. Fifty Shades of Grey opened up an avenue within women. And my question is, why? Was it because it was written by a woman, regardless yeah. of its structure? Was it because it somehow gave women who had never had permission permission to have a fantasy, whatever that fantasy was. I, I'm trying to figure out from a... Uh, it's, it's no surprise to me at all. Why? My opinion only. Yes. Why? Because... 
a touch of kink is normal in everybody. And that book normalized it by putting it in a Harlequin framework. But Harlequin did that, and it was never... This thing is also the Bible, Gloria. This book, first of all, it already had an established fan base of Twilight fans. Yes. That's where it started. Yeah. It was, that it made it more permissible to people because it was a fanfic, and everybody understands that fanfic takes a lot of uh, privileges and license. But if that be the case, then it's appealing to a very specific generation because Twilight, you know, for good or ill, is a kid series. Yes, but once it's in the culture and it's acceptable, like if there was a fanfic of Harry Potter where they were all having sex as grown-ups, it probably also would do really well if it was if it hit the right sex notes, the fantasies that people ordinarily wouldn't encounter that are just a little kinkier. And I don't think Fifty Shades of Grey would have been half as successful if uh, the lead male character wasn't a billionaire. Yeah, because they need to be arrested. You know, that's just a bad night on, cap you know, on cops or something which again plays into the swept away. So it's just a really <clears throat> middle of the road capitalistic fantasy. Yeah, once you take away all of the fairly decent SM scenes. But it-, it um, that's, what was, that's what was cracked to them. This is the ultimate, I mean, You've been watching Squid Game, I assume, or know of it. Yeah. All right. So it's as much as that show is anti-capitalism, her basic premise was pro-capitalism because here's a woman who is made the lust object of a billionaire. Oh, dear. What can she do? In a way, it's sort of like a 19th century fantasy where the maid gets fucked by the master of the house, but then he falls in love with in her. In love with her, yeah. Even though he raped her. He falls in love with her. And she with him, even though he raped her. <laughs> what did I have so forgiving a heart? <laughs> you know? I mean, it is built in, and really, all, all, although S&M is, that's where it came out in some explicit detail most of those books are about power relationships yeah it's about women being swept off their feet suddenly unable to resist vulnerable turned on in a new way that they'd never been turned on before while someone's tearing their bodice would it have worked had it been written by a man <clears throat> you know my first reaction when you said that was nah it's probably not gendered but as I think about it, who have been some of the big, big writers? Pauline Riage with the story of O. Mm -hmm. Anne Rice with her beauty series. Mm -hmm. And now Fifty Shades. And these have all been really works that captured the, pub captured the public's imagination in a big way. Yes captured women's imaginations. Specifically women. And what was the secret to their success? I don't know, but would that book have been received as well if it was a man? I don't think so. And I think with Riage, who wrote it in like uh, 1926, and I don't remember her real name, Riage was a pseudonym, nom de oh. Do, uh, yeah. something Dory. Dominique Ori. Yes, Dominique Ori. Right. Um, that book, I think, was based on some Victorian, you know, sexology and the basic idea that women were masochists at heart. Well, it was also based Very on... Very Freudian. Yeah. 
What? It was also based on a dare. Her boyfriend. Right, from a lover who was driving her nuts because he wasn't giving her what she wanted. But he was also her publisher. Said, yeah, no, very you nice. can write in the style of Desaad, who was his favorite author. And she took him up on it. Right. So she tried to create it. But, you know, I never liked the story of O. I mean, I had like sections that I jerk off to, but I didn't like the whole book as a book because I felt like she was really self annihilating. Agreed. You know, and that really she was having an erotic breakdown, you know, in her head, kind of like nine and a half weeks. That was another. Yeah, well, nine and a half weeks. But. Um, you know, I mean, it was still sort of the, the decline of the Victorian heroine into a, you know. Interesting. Yeah, that's how I saw it. So I thought that was not tremendously empowered writing. But when Anne Rice came around, she was mentored by John Preston. Yes. So the famous SM novelist, to those who don't know. Um, and men were there being tortured alongside women. And still, these are produced by women. Yes. Now, how do you, since each of these has unlocked, uh, if only temporarily, a certain amount of sexual fantasy and therefore sexual freedom? Mm-hmm. How do you kick that door wide open? What is the formula? Is it intellectual? Is it fact-based? Is it fantasy-based? What is the formula that is going to keep that door wide open instead of, I've read it, oh my God, I can jerk off to it, my husband will whatever, no. And then it gets put away and everything that got unlocked goes back into Pandora's box and gets locked again. Well, that's the difference between, and this is another fruitful uh, area for research, is really the difference between the choices we make to live in society or to conform to family expectations and what we permit ourselves sexually. Ooh. Most people don't have the kind of sex they really want, I've discovered. Or at least not the ones who see me. I guess they wouldn't be seeing me if they were getting the kind of sex that they wanted. But, uh, you know, certainly that's pretty common, that people live in marriages long after the spark goes out, long after the connection runs out. Lots of kinky people marry vanilla partners and lock it away, you know. Lots of people who always present as vanilla and act as vanilla are keeping secrets because diversity is the norm. You shouldn't have a whole suburb of people having the same kind of sex every night. What the fuck is that about? Think about that. Do they even use the same toothpaste in every house on that street? <laughs> Do they eat the same breakfast every morning? No. So why are they all trying to have reproductive sex in the same position? Because remember, by law, we're not supposed to enjoy it. In the missionary position for the purpose of procreation only. Right. But you ask, you know, you stand back and you look at that as a sexologist and you go, they're in trouble. <laughs> they're in trouble if they're not even doing anything creative with their partner. And I've known couples like that. I mean, I've worked with couples like that. That is the only thing they do in bed. There are some advantages to being a lesbian. So I have a feeling that a lot of the women who read these, this book that made it so popular are either really, really horny and single or divorced or widowed and horny and single. Or they're not, they've never felt the kind of 
high they imagine that people in books are feeling from Ooh. sex. And they want that. Look, we're all primates, right? We're all looking to see who's got what and is somebody better off. And that applies to sex. What, what are they doing? Why, why do they seem so happy? Oh, they're doing that thing. Oh, I'd never do that. Wait, let me try it. Oh. <laughs> You know, but it's getting them to the place where they say, let me try that. That sometimes yeah. is the hardest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what subjects, what questions do you have about sex? And how it works? None that I can articulate because I just had way too much fun with it to think about it. I'd be on the sidelines taking notes. I mean, even in an S, I mean, I'm, I'm just terrible that way, but even in an S and M club, I used to love walking around because it was all material. <laughs> there were some I would watch any scene. It didn't matter how extreme, how weird, how bizarre. I loved it all because it was new and different. And it would make me wonder, what the fuck are they getting out of that? But then I would, you know, but then I would get answers for what the fuck they're getting out of it. For me, it was something I could feel. Um, there were a lot of scenes that I have watched that I would never try. Mm -hmm. um, for a thousand different reasons. But one of the classics that I, I watched... Um, J.D. Boucher, and I don't know if you would remember him from the 90s. He was the first Mr. Fantasy but okay. he, and from Dallas, but he was also a magician whose specialty was fire. I watched him do a scene with a young lady. They connected in a way that you could feel across the room. And I walked in and, and instantly knew something was going on because I could feel the energy wave and followed the wave until I found the scene that was creating it. Nice. Um, and those are the ones that I stopped to watch. When the connection between all of the players, because they could be two or more, is so hot, it's generating a wave that I can feel. I want to know what the hell you're doing doesn't necessarily mean I'm ever going to try it. But I want to ride that wave with you, whatever it may be. Uh, and I keep coming back to the power that is created by that energy and why we let it die instead of continuing to ride it one way or another, whether it be for the for the strength it gives in everyday life, whether or not it's because it became so empowering to me that um, I had to go out and do something. Um, mm -hmm. And some of what I'm having so much trouble, I guess, articulating is what I watch this next generation already latch onto. It seems to be innate in all of these women that I've been talking to. And I'm fascinated by the fact that while the library has a lot of male groupies, and I'm not saying yay or nay, who, like the cool kids, stay in the library, far more are women than men. And if creating that place where both intellectual and energy exchanges can happen. Why can't it just keep going on? Why do we then shut down that power? Do and you mean this in a cultural way or in a personal way? What do you? I don't know, about? Lori. I don't know. I mean, I can tell you that historically sex is yay it's all great have all the sex you want sex is horrible sex is sinful sex is bad sex is great sex is wonderful sex is horrible sex is sinful 
sex is great, but it's only great for the rich classes. <laughs> sex for, no, the rich classes aren't doing sex. Nobody can do sex anymore. You know, it, it's, hmm. it's a pendulum throughout human history. And it has as much to do with political and social forces. Well, I mean, it's all about, in my view, political and social forces, meaning governments and how those governments rise and what they, where they get traction. So like somebody like a Trump, he got a lot of traction by hating on gay people. And if he had been allowed to continue, maybe eventually he would have gotten to us too. That was my expectation that <clears throat> you would see increased shutting down of uh, gay and bi-friendly and poly-friendly and all of that kind of stuff. Anything that Trump was not doing would get shut down because it was all about him. And that, you know, so, and that was my big fear is that, you know, one bad president and 40 years of progress in sex could be shut down. You know, in Germany in the 1920s, there was this enormous burgeoning LGBTQ community and a kink community that was very active in Europe. In and the, the publishers that went with them because and we've the got publishers, 15 of them sitting in the library. And right. And all of the little businesses that made all the specialty gear and all of that stuff that were really starting to thrive in the 1930s. Almost overnight, the Nazis shut down Berlin. Yes. And you went from bustling clubs, more exciting than Castro Street in the heyday, or just as exciting, to Nazi flags and shutters on every window. Everywhere, yeah. And populations removed. So. You know, you cannot ignore, that's why sex and politics is a very important area. Law and sex is huge because our court system is 40 years behind the science. Easily, easily. You know, they don't understand consent the way we understand consent. They don't understand informed consent as opposed to, yeah, you know, like, you know, the wife who feels like she's being raped every night in bed by her husband, she has no place to go. She has nobody to tell. Did you say yes? Well, you are married. Maybe you should get more into it and initiate. You know, I mean, there's just nowhere for her to go, no voice for her to find. I mean, no, nobody who wants to hear her voice. You know, so courts really don't understand that. They barely understand emotional abuse. They barely understand the difference between BDSM consent and non-consent. And the NCSF just got a brand new ruling on that in, uh, I want to say, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're hoping that other states will follow, but at least it's a start. Let me tell you something that I just learned. In 44 states in America, child marriage is still legal. It's still legal, yeah. If you have, you got, if some fucker, knocks up your 13 year old daughter and you're the kind of good Christian people who don't want to cause a scandal, you allow him to marry her if he yeah. wants to. And it's legal. And he could be 30 and she could be or 13. Older. Or older. Mm -hmm. I and there, you've covered it up. 
you know, so I would say this is a, a crisis situation in America that we still have 44 states where it's legal to rape little girls, basically, and then cover it up by marrying. Her. By marriage, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we have, you know, one th people ask sometimes, you know, things are so much better now than they used to be. Are you happy? And I'm, I'm like, I'll, I'll be happy when I see all of the old anti S and M laws get scrubbed off the books. I'll be happy when people don't use domestic violence laws to go after consensual players. Thank you. Or when they don't use a BDSM defense when someone has been abusive, a phenomenon we've seen a lot of in the courts where men go, well, she consented to it, did she? Big difference between sadism and psychopathia. You know, and really a lot of these laws still exist, which means that if you live someplace with a nasty politician or a nasty DA, he can dredge up a law from 1912 that says 90% of your sex life is illegal and throw you in the slammer. Yeah. So we have terrible laws. And as and I found out- we have terrible forensic psychologists not all of them i mean for but it's true i had a fetishist some years ago who came to me completely traumatized because he had a he was an adult baby mm -hmm. and his psychologist who was helping him with a different problem sent him to a psychiatrist because she didn't know what it was or what it meant and the psychiatrist put him through aversion training for his fetish. And by the time I saw him, he was really more traumatized from that that he had been from his fetish because they made him feel like he was just any day now he was gonna rape a child. And <laughs> absolutely not anything that he had ever thought about, wanted, or anything. He was strictly about wearing a diaper on himself. I got and not even really getting into the baby role play, but just that he was a diaper lover, you know? And um, he sent me the workup from the forensic psychiatrist and I couldn't believe this was used as evidence in court or would have been used as evidence in court. And since this particular forensic psychiatrist was really successful, had often used evidence like this in court. And you know, aversion therapy is quackery. It doesn't work. So there's something that women should be thinking about, you know, politics and sex, the law and sex, child rights and sex. These are issues at the heart of the American conscience, conscious that where grave injustices occur every day or even the plight of sex workers. They live in such a completely schizophrenic environment. Yeah. I mean, why do they get treated so bad by clients? Because the culture tells them that's okay. Because the culture makes them see sex workers as lesser, lesser people. And they believe it themselves. They're lesser. Yes. And, thank and that that's promotes ugly, unethical conduct. Yeah. You know, and you can talk to your blue in the face and tell them that it's all a product of oppression, but how do you actually help them break that cycle? Yeah. 
you know, we really do need concrete solutions to, God, I could just go on and on, Vi, about where people need to work. I mean, obviously reproductive rights, which are have been under assault from the entire right wing for the last God knows how long. Access to birth control. I mean, why is our country struggling with this? The last of all the first world countries to still be this immature about sex. Right, come on, we were founded as a nation whose first, well, not counting First Nation, whose first inhabitants were so hung up, the Brits threw us out. I mean, think about that. We're talking about one of the most sexually repressive countries in the world, and we were so hung up, they couldn't handle it. And then we completely uh, falsified our histories. Well, we're still doing that. Yeah, but I mean, everything about America is bullshit. <laughs> Who came over on the Mayflower? Criminals, same ones that went over uh, to Australia. But I was always taught it was these pious Christians who just wanted religious freedom. And then I find out, uh, and they were all white, by the way. And then you find out they weren't all white and they were atheists on the ship. Mm -hmm. You know, so out of that little party, only like two thirds were white Christians, not even half, maybe. And the rest were people of color and atheists. I never learned that. History is written by the victor, Glory. Yep. If they actually told the entire truth about how this nation was founded and what it was founded on. And let's not even get into what our founding fathers thought of religion. Um, all of the United States tenants would have to be re-examined. Re yes, so I think that as is true everywhere in the world, we see it, that fundamentalism is really kind of the enemy of human freedom. Yeah. You know, so sex and religion, that is some fertile ground for the brave soul who isn't afraid of being continuously censored. <laughs> You know, it's, yeah, so sexologists can become interested in the law and do forensic, but they can also take an interest in the medical side as I have and work with people to overcome sexual dysfunctions, which I like it. I like it. is a great, very, very rewarding experience. Because you get people who've been to doctors and tried all the drugs and the dilators and the everything else, and none of that has worked for them. And then they come to your office and you talk to them about their feelings and they start healing. And that's yeah. such a beautiful process. And of course, you can be a writer, you can be an advisor, you can be a columnist, you can work for some of the really big sex toy companies and pursue a corporate career if that's what you want. You'll have the advantage on be, you know, being the credentialed sex expert. So there are lots of different ways sexologists uh, apply their craft. But I, I believe that it is through the eyes and sensibilities of women that all of this is going to change. I, I can't put my finger on why, and maybe that is in and of itself horrendously sexist. And I'm willing to cop to that. Me too. I feel the same way. You know, save the cheerleader, save the world. I'm like, save the women, save the world. And I love men and I appreciate those who have created so many wonderful things for us in the world, but it's time for women to rise and shine. And unify. 
for fuck's sake, we get a hell of a lot more done to you. We'll never, you know, it's just the law of averages. At any given time in human history, there's always been one third of people who are fighting chain to change tooth and nail. Why? I would say they're maybe it's they're more scared than others. Interesting. You know, but I don't know. I just know that throughout human history, there's always, and it's a dangerous one third because every now and then, they lay the problem. Right. They go Taliban on you. Yeah. You know, but wow, the field of sex needs strong, independent minded people who are over all of the conformative bullshit. Well said. You know, who are not going to tell you what their parents told you and what their preachers told you and, you know, what their politicians think. They're going to tell you what their original research has told them. And that's why I leaned heavily on, I'm not, I was not a scientist, remember, I started as a poet, you know, <laughs> but I always liked biology. It was like my one thing because it was human. And uh, I educated myself. I kept going after my PhD. I wanted to understand more. I wanted to understand, in order to really comprehensively understand the science of sex, you have to read what urologists are up to. True. You have to read what gynecologists are doing. Sometimes you have to read what gastroenterologists are doing. <laughs> I haven't thought that far, but okay. No, so maybe not gas, but but certainly endocrinologists, because they, hmm. you know, hormones. And these people have money for research, because this is another thing. Very, you know, how did I do this? I did this by funding all my own research. In other words, and I didn't have money money so what that just meant was putting in the hours putting in the time that's what I always had to do my own research like a good scholar I think any woman can do what I did any smart woman maybe do it even better than me one thing I can tell you is you have a generation of women coming after you. We're holding you up as a role model for okay. research. For Work hard. Do your research. And I... Take care of yourself. Yeah. Don't just be a machine. Learn experientially, too. Because I would say that's been critical to being a sexologist for me. You know, there are a lot of people out there who do sex therapy, but they don't have that much experience with sex. Hmm. I mean, hmm. you like to think that they have a lot, hmm. but maybe they don't. Maybe they don't have that much experience with sex outside of their own little bubble of what it is that they do with their partner and me you know me by <laughs> you know and I learned I try to learn from every situation you know I'm in the process of evolving even as we speak because now I am the single mistress of a slave girl I just uh, new relationship parameters. Yeah. New system. Now it's all my system, not her master system. <laughs> She's adjusting. I'm adjusting. You know, I keep joking with her. We're going to have to sit down and negotiate a whole new thing. But, you know, we're <laughs> negotiating it. You know, when you're together 20 years, you know, we're kind of negotiating as we go. But I'm changing. I'm being a different kind of dom with her than I've ever been. Also true. You know, because 
20 years of love and submission and now she's my slave. So it's a little different. And she's a different person. The natural evolution there. You have evolved together though. Yeah. And that's a wonderful thing. It is. So, but that's what I mean about experiential, the experiential component is really important. Like when sexologists, and I've met some, get so caught up in the sexology that they're not having sex, it's not a good thing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because they're losing that constant growth experience that you get through intimacy. Here, here. Here, here. So, you know, and that's why people can get up and talk about BDSM and be off. Try not to curse a whole lot. (laughs) More informed, smarter, and more articulate than people who just studied it on paper for 10 years. Because they know what they're talking about. They've experienced it. And they've experienced watching others do it. And they've seen other styles and they've seen where people have made mistakes because it blows up in their face. We've all seen the psycho breakups in s and you know? And yet we also have seen the couples that, or the families that last forever, like you and Jill. It's like, what's your secret? Right? And only you can speak to that because you probably, even within the community, I think that it's probably the record for longevity in a relationship. Good Lord, I hadn't thought about well, that. Well, yeah, maybe the bonds had you beat, but you know. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that suddenly I feel very old, Gloria. No, it's just, it's not that you're very old. It's just that you have had this amazing eternally enduring beautiful thing going on with Jill you know where other people you know they're 15 partners down the road from you they started at the same age (laughs) and you know there have been some wonderful women in my life Mm -hmm. Uh, but the the rock that the castle sits on is named Jill Carter Right, and I had that with Will. You know, we were together 31 years, you know, and it was uh, the same thing. We changed and evolved and got old enough to get really grumpy with each other too. And, (laughs) you know. know, And which landmines to tiptoe around and, you know, all of this stuff that goes into a long, but I mean, So I feel that uh, keeping it human, that's my biggest piece of advice. I like it. Keeping it human. Remembering that other people haven't walked in your shoes, that you may know a lot more than them, which means if you're a caring, humanistic person, you want to help them by sharing that. Not so that they emulate you so much as that they find inspiration and do it their own way. You know, so I would never presume that like women of color are going to do it my way. We come from very different cultural places. I'm an atheist, but I'm also very Jewish in some ways, and the Jews have this thing about tikkun, which means repairing the world, and it's always meant a lot to me, that the world is a messy, disappointing place, and if you can change one life for the better, you've accomplished something in this world, and I take that to heart, I really do. That's why I'm always lost in my thoughts when you see me. I'm off somewhere. (laughs) 
<laughs> As I sit and think and listen about the, to this conversation, I realize more and more that the, the library's greatest purpose may simply be to provide a safe space. The library repairs the world. To, to come and sit, to come and talk. But you're also doing this enormous service to all of the writers whose words would be forgotten if you weren't preserving them in your library. Whose great thoughts and great experiences and great, look, you've told me time and again, it's that one article that popped up in Prometheus by me, right? Who'd even remember it? Print media from the 90s? Who the hell, you know? I mean, it's great that we have a community that tries to preserve this, but I can assure you every issue of Prometheus is packed with interesting stuff and all of it would be lost if you were not collecting. The safe space, Glory. Providing the safe space for whatever may come out of it. Yeah. And uh, I realize more and more just how important that safe space is. Uh, I would love to see, led by far greater and far more academic and intellectual minds, a woman's think tank come out of the library. I'm volunteering to be on it, so there you go. A serious, um, as in ultimately funded, a serious think tank. Wouldn't that be nice? I've or, always wanted a BDSM think tank. By women, about women. And the, the force of nature, because I, in this case, I don't like the word power. The force of nature that is the feminine mind and spirit in all that entails. A place where the good ideas are going to come and then women are going to retreat from it. They're going to experiment with it and discuss it and, you know, roll it and polish it until it becomes that force. And then to keep creating those until those bowling balls become boulders that start to crack that psychology that says you can't or you shouldn't. And it's only going to be, what do the kids say, FUBU for us, by us? It's going to be women creating, thinking, funding, doing, and working. It has to be. And maybe all of that is going to come out of a simple safe place for women to get together to talk. There's got to be a way to do this, Gloria. You, and not just you, um, Jennifer Erickson, who works on the BDSM research team, Gail, um, as much as I love the work Karis is doing, um, there's still too many guys on that panel. Um, Women creating for women, mm -hmm. not with the intellectual or financial per permission of men. Support. I mean, what's really important is how many men will ally with us. And that's, that's always been a, a problem in feminist circles too. <sighs> Getting enough male allies who aren't just gay men, because gay men are beautiful. You know, but um, straight men, straight white men. And as a group, maybe. Maybe there's some is... good ones, but there's a core of patriarchy that we have seen its ugly head in our scene. And maybe that's why women on women at a 
when when anything is beginning my humble opinion only if it seeks the outside voice for support ultimately you're going to find somebody who wants to water down the project as much as down the road we will need those allies right you're right it's it's got to be women relying on women to talk to to explore without fear to to verbalize to create without turning to the male ally for uh the shield the protection or even the financial support at a certain point in time we are going to have to fund our own research I would rather get the money from Sarah Lawrence than Harvard. Um, if for no other reason, then it's women supporting women. And right. maybe that's reverse sexism. I'll own it. No, I don't think it's sexist to have a gendered space. Because I'm just, as I watch these young beauties talking and feeling. as long as we accept that all women are women huh that it includes transgender women too a woman's a woman a how woman's you a woman. got there is not my business correct okay so yeah i don't see anything uh disrespectful about an organization by and for women you know i i but I'll leave it up to you to found it between you and Jill. I think we have a lot of uh, think tanky and thought going on anyway. It is so easy to change this, the flow of that river with just a few misplaced pebbles. Yeah. Um, And like I said, Gloria, I wish you could have seen what I saw in a group of uh, probably 140 women with probably some total eight to 10 men. Pulse was a judge. Um, and he just let his feminine side run. And everybody was delighted. There were maybe eight men in the entire event. Mm -hmm. It was women on women with women creating and talking to and for women and all of the rampant sex you could figure out in positions and places my body doesn't even bend to anymore. But listening to all of those creative minds mm -hmm. was so exciting. That sounds exciting. And uh you know, and then all the, the, the sex you can handle on top of all of that wonderful stimulation was just amazing. And what happens, look at what happens when we're not shut down. Oh, we're yeah. Directed only by ourselves. Huge energy. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> So shall we do this next week again? How about two? Are you done with me? Never. <laughs> well, I hope to all the beautiful women out there that you're listening and you're getting hyped up to follow in Mama Boy's footsteps and change our world in your own way. It's coming, Glory. We've got some thinking to do. Um, it's time to get great female minds together. To and me, I'm just a shit disturber from way back when, so nothing gets yes. me down. Fuck them. Usually when people tell me, you can't do that, that's my next goal is to get that done. <laughs> We've come a long way, you and I, Vi. And now I look to that magnificent mind of yours to put 
intellectual weight to a crazy old woman's idea. Are you talking about Jill? No. <laughs> Me and thee. Oh, well, I'm crazy as a shithouse rat, so that's good. That, that, that would be me, you know. <laughs> you know. I keep looking at the kids and, the, and you know, Jill goes, you want to do what? <laughs> we need it. And I watched it. And I have no idea how to make it grow, but I know it can. We shall resume the journey and take it together. I hope yeah. I see you soon. It's you and, and me two weeks from today until we can get together. I want you to think about that because the more I listen to you, the more I listen to those kids, the more I realize a woman's think tank is probably 15 years overdue. Cool. Make it so. We have some things to work on and okay. least to think about. Certainly to think about. I'll be thinking about thinking for next I'll time. take that. I'll take that. I got to run. See you in two weeks. Okay. See you in two weeks. Bye for now.